Okay, so I'm going to change tack and talk, talk more at the micro level. Basically, how do we think about uncertainty? So think about decisions, think about judgments. How do we do this stuff? There are a variety of ways. We could use... I'm faster than this. <laughs> so we could use a rational framework. We could be blinking. We could be using intuition. So no matter what framework we use for making decision, underlying all these, there is a very deep and widespread characteristic of human psychology, which we call illusion of control, which means that we tend to assume we have more control than we actually do. And the manifestation of that is we don't realize the limits to predictability, we, are under, we underestimate uncertainty around us. The opposite state of illusion of control is fatalism, where you assume you have no control when you actually do. As human beings, we've put a very high price on fatalism for right reasons, but as a result, we often fall prey to illusion of control and underestimate the costs of doing so. Because of illusion of control, we have developed in an evolutionary sense many biases which permeate all kinds of decision-making frameworks, rational, intuition, and so on. We are overconfident, we have the anchoring bias, meaning we see patterns where none exists, and so on. And I'm going to give you a few examples of this. This is the US market, 1987 to 2000. We look at this and we try to understand what is going to happen in the future. So a person looks at it, makes an assessment, and, and makes a forecast, which you're going to see in a minute. Writes a book called Dow 36,000. I can see it basically extrapolates the data. That book sells a lot. Person makes a million dollars, gets invited to CNBC. Another person says, okay, I'm going to write 40,000. Same thing happens, makes millions of dollars. Another person says, I'll go all the way to 100,000. But this is the kind of stuff we do. Here's another book published in 2005 talking about the robustness of real estate in California and you know basically what happened here. Now this is all a manifestation of illusion of control in the sense that we underestimate the uncertainty. We are assuming that we have more control than we actually do and so on. What is the cost of illusion of control? This kind of data is very well known. I've used a time window which is very well published, very well known. In between 1984-2002, if you had put your money in a passive fund without being active, you would have earned 13% on an average. Average mutual fund manager would have earned 9%. And average retail investors like all of us would have earned only 3%. Here's another example of cost of illusion of control. We have lots of optimal portfolio theories. There are 14 theories right now which get a lot of attention, some of them backed up by Nobel Prizes. We take each one of these theories, compare it to a simple naive rule where you divide your assets among n available assets, and, and you, that rule often outperforms the optimal portfolio theory. So it's not just about money, it permeates other domains of our life. We get a headache, what do we think? Let's call a doctor. Now, if you live in a developed country, Western Europe, Hong Kong, Singapore, United States. If you go to a doctor, what do doctors tell you? They tell you control your cholesterol, control your blood pressure, your weight, eat fruits and vegetables, make sure you exercise, don't smoke, don't drink, and don't work in coal mines, work in some office. <laughs> we do all this, the result is what? We take Kozar for blood pressure, Lipitor for cholesterol, and, and so on, but in doing so, we don't realize some of the side, side effects of those medicines. You control all those eight major risk factors, they explain only 20% of the variation in life expectancy. 80% is still unexplained. And, and as a result, we don't understand the uncertainty and fall uh, prey to the cost. Now, it's not about just throwing your hands up in the air and not doing anything. We talk about steps to deal with this. The very first important step is to know what you don't know. To accept the fact that there are some kind of uncertainties which are irreducible. There is no way you can get rid of them. You have to learn to deal with them. Second is to assess what you can assess. These are like the known unknowns. We have lots of very well developed tools and techniques which come from the rational tradition, contextual knowledge, intuition. We assess in the best possible manner. That there are techniques like averaging, using independent experts and so on. However, even if you do that very well, what you have to keep in mind, and in all probability, you've still underestimated the uncertainty because of things like the unknown unknowns, which are sometimes now popularly called black swans, but also because of some of the known unknowns, which cannot be modeled easily. For example, 
Will there be another acid bubble in the next five years? Will there be another earthquake in the next two years? These are things we know will happen, but we are still not able to predict them very well. These are known unknowns which we can't model. So you have to augment the uncertainty and find ways to manage it. So what I talked about in two and a half hours, I've tried to do in five minutes today. 